James Kennedy Ministries presents Truths That Transform. What will life after death be like? The Bible paints a picture of eternal life that far differs from the secular and pagan versions. Find out how on today's Truths That Transform. This is Truths That Transform. Welcome to Truths That Transform, a production of D. James Kennedy Ministries, where we are standing for truth and defending your freedom. For years, popular media has been full of representations of life after death. In some depictions, the afterlife is a place with clouds and a vague white glow. In others, like the movie Ghost, those who have died remain on earth invisible but trying to communicate with and influence their loved ones. But what does the Bible teach? Is there really life after death? And if so, what does it look like? On today's program, we'll investigate that question and we'll share with you a resource that will help you see it more clearly from a biblical perspective. As we begin, we welcome our own John Rabe to the program. John has written a Truth in Action Q&A booklet for us called, Did Jesus Rise from the Dead?, which we'll tell you more about a bit later in the program. John, welcome. Good to have you here. Thank you, Frank. Always nice to be with you. So the most direct question to deal with the resurrection is, is there any afterlife to be resurrected to? And if there absolutely is, Frank, and and we all intuitively know that. The scripture says that God has placed eternity in our hearts. C.S. Lewis pointed out that it's it would be very odd for there to be such a thing as hunger without there being such a thing as food. Um, the fact that we have a desire for something is at least a pretty strong indication that something exists to fulfill that desire. Of course, in our sinfulness, those desires get twisted, but they do point us to something. We all have the desire for eternal life. We have the desire for life who goes on that goes on. And I even think about um, you know the, the the great baseball player. Ted Ted Williams, who was an agnostic or an atheist, but had his body frozen in the hopes that eventually he would, uh, science would be able to come up with a cure for whatever disease he had and bring him back to life. So we all have that desire. And the good news is, is that the Bible is very clear that eternal life does exist. And the souls of human beings, your soul, my soul, the soul of everyone watching is immortal in the sense that it will it will never go out of existence now that it's here. Uh, we will be raised, but w- there are two resurrections. Some will be raised unto life and some will be raised unto everlasting punishment. And that presents a problem for all of us because how do we face that judgment? And many of these depictions of the afterlife are about how that judgment works. Right. There's a, a, a television program on NBC right now called The Good Place. And the entire premise of the program is that these are people in the afterlife and they're trying to figure out how they actually get into the good place. And and it's all they're all throwing different ideas around and all trying to figure it out and nobody really knows. That's kind of where we're at uh, if we're very honest about it until we see the truth of the gospel. And the truth of the gospel tells us that we can have everlasting life and meet the standards of that judgment, not in ourselves. We are sinners. We fall far short of the judgment. But that Jesus Christ obeying in our place, dying for our sins, his righteousness credited to us can get us to the good place, so to speak. All of our hopes of heaven being in the presence of God forever and ever hinge on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And wouldn't you know, the resurrection is the one thing that the secular culture cannot stand. Why is that so? That's right, because if you have a resurrection, first of all, that makes Jesus Christ Lord. And that means that you have to answer to Christ. The culture doesn't want to answer to Christ, so they have a vested interest in denying the resurrection. We also are sort of natural Pharisees. We want to earn our own way to God. And the resurrection of Jesus says that he has earned our way to God for us. Um, You would think that that would be good news, but to the natural man, it's not because the natural man wants to stand and be 
judged on his own merits. What he doesn't understand is that his own merits are actually demerits and are worthy only of condemnation. And so, yeah, the, the culture wants to deny the resurrection of Jesus Christ, but everything hinges on Christ's resurrection. And Paul tells us that. If Jesus has not been raised, live it up, eat, drink. Mm -hmm. For tomorrow we die. That's the end of it. Our bodies do go into the ground and everything is darkness and we are just those accidental atoms that Bertrand Russell talked about. The accidental collocation of atoms that's just material that came together for a time and then breaks up and goes and does other things. But if Jesus has been raised from the dead, then we have proof of everlasting life. And that everlasting life is offered to you and to me and to everyone. So the the scriptures promise us untold glories and the presence of Christ forever and ever. But when Jesus came, he said, I've come that you have life and have it to the full. And he was talking about our life here on earth. How should our view of heaven inform our daily life here on earth? That's a very important question, and I think that is why the resurrection is so vital even to our faith now. When we have this sort of heavenly, ethereal, disembodied picture of the afterlife, it makes everything that happens here seem unimportant. But the biblical picture is actually different. I think C.S. Lewis captured this really nicely in his novel, The Great Divorce. And in that, as uh, people go into heaven, what they find is if they're not properly prepared for it, it's not that heaven is less real and less tangible than the earth is. It's that it's more so because everything is more real. Everything is more solid than it is in this state. When we recognize that the resurrection changes everything, we realize all of our work on earth has eternal purpose. This earth is going to be glorified. It's going to be redeemed. It's going to be renewed. And so our work here will be purified it will be burned by fire in purification, as Peter tells us, but it's not unimportant. It's imbued with eternal significance. And we have his promise, don't we? He said, when he, before he ascended, he said, I go to prepare a place for you so that where I am, you can be also. That's our destiny. Life, abundant life, unimaginably abundant life but lived in the presence of Almighty God. And that's the promise of the new covenant, that I will be their God, they will be my people, he will be eternally present with us. And the exciting thing is, is yes, we go to be with him. He prepares a place there. But then what does uh, the end of the book of Revelation show us? That the new Jerusalem descends from heaven and the dwelling of God is with man. That heaven, in a sense, the, 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 the believers, the church, comes back to earth and earth and heaven are joined at that point. And Jesus is the light. We don't need any light because he is the light of the city. And, and there is this joining of heaven and earth that ultimately takes place. The presence of the Lord being the central defining feature of that afterlife. And we say thanks be to God. Amen. John, good to have you with us. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Frank. Always a pleasure. While we are adept at employing many strategies to avoid the subject, even in our own minds, Death is a reality we all face. It is the inexorable event that hangs over every life, whether we acknowledge it or not, or whether we suppress it or not. But what if death itself can be overcome? Well, that is exactly what has happened. As Dr. Kennedy explains in this portion of his message, is there really life after death? It was the day of resurrection the resurrection of that one who had sundered the centuries apart and split time forevermore and now had come to break the bands of death and set the prisoners free. Jesus Christ had risen from the dead. He is the greatest person who ever lived. For many reasons, one of them is that he solved the greatest problem that we have or ever will have, and that is the problem of death. The king of terrors, it has rightly been called. The Bible says that Satan has kept the whole world in bondage throughout our whole lives through the fear of death. Christ has overcome death and the tomb and brought life and immortality to light in such a way that it is incontrovertible 
Please note this. The resurrection of Jesus Christ, which we celebrate today, is the best proved fact of history. Consider the words of Professor Thomas Arnold, who is a professor of history at Oxford University, the author of the three-volume History of Rome. This man, among other things, said this, I have been used for many years to study the histories of other times and to examine and weigh the evidence for those who have written about them. And I know of not one fact in the history of mankind which is proved by better and fuller evidence of every sort than the resurrection of Christ. There is a great historian, professor of history at Oxford University. Not one fact in the history of mankind proved by better and fuller evidence. Or consider Lord Lyndhurst. He was elected as Solicitor General of the British government and then the Attorney General of Great Britain. And finally, he was the High Chancellor of England. This man, with all of those titles, said, I know pretty well what evidence is. And I tell you, such evidence as that for the resurrection of Christ has never broken down yet. Many of the laws of evidence used in our courtrooms today were invented by Simon Greenleaf. And after having examined every thread of evidence for the resurrection, came to conclude this. If the evidence for the resurrection of Christ were presented before any unbiased courtroom in the world, they would have to conclude that Jesus Christ actually rose from the dead. Professor Dr. Simon Greenleaf, Royal Professor of Law at Harvard University. My friends, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is demonstrated and proved by fuller and more evidence of every sort than any other event in the history of the world. Christ rose from the dead. But my friends, what that proves is that we too will rise, all of us, everyone. Not only that, I can tell you this, I'm not concerned about being put into a casket and put into a grave. I will be more alive than I have ever been alive in my life. Not only am I never going to go into a grave or a casket, this may startle some of you, but I am never going to die. And if you're planning to die, I, I really feel sorry for you. How can you say that? Jesus Christ said it. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whosoever believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Death and taxes, they say, are the only sure things in life. Neither is a very appealing prospect. Woody Allen famously joked, I'm not afraid of dying, I just don't want to be there when it happens. But the Christian view of death stands in incredible contrast with other views. Death is an enemy, but one that has been defeated by Jesus Christ's resurrection from the dead. So what actually happens when we die? Our own Dr. Jerry Newcomb takes a closer look. I can't think of anything more important than answering the question, what happens one minute after you die? I'm not 100% sure what I believe about what happens after, de after death. I've always wanted to know where you go after you die. 
I wrote the book One Minute After You Die because of its obvious interest. I think everyone should be interested in what happens to them one minute after they die. According to a recent survey, 22% of Americans think about death every single day. I was in Dallas, Texas, went into a, a steakhouse with a pastor friend. And so um, the, the gal came up to, to wait on the table and I said to her, I said, you know, I heard a really interesting statistic today and I just, I gotta ask you a question. This, it said one in five people think about death every day. I said, you're the first person I've talked to since I heard that, I gotta ask you, do you think about death every day? And she just began to weep and she pulled up her sleeves and her wrists were just destroyed. She said, I've tried to kill myself on several occasions. This last time, about three months ago, I, I, I was in the hospital for a month. I've been out, out and every day I've been wondering what's going to happen to me. And I've been praying to God, if there is a God, would you please send someone to tell me what's going to happen? And, and we had the joy of sharing the gospel with her and leading her to Jesus and plugging her into a, the, the church because this pastor was right there. The book of Hebrews is very clear. It is appointed unto man once to die and after death the judgment. Of course, one aspect of this subject is politically incorrect today, and that's the notion that not everyone is going to heaven when they die. When I wrote the book, One Minute After You Die, and I wrote the chapter on hell that's in the book, I remember being so burdened about people dying without Christ that I left the house, I walked over to my neighbor who was mowing his lawn, and he stopped the lawnmower, and I told him about hell and why he needed to repent. I mean, when we capture the reality of this so that it isn't simply a theoretical discussion, we are motivated to help people to understand the good news of the gospel and how they can avoid hell by faith and trust in Jesus Christ. I don't think that we can really reclaim America until we understand the full gospel and its implications. When Jesus died on the cross, thankfully, he took our hell. And in those three hours when he was under God's wrath, he endured what you and I should endure throughout all of eternity, but he bore it. When a believer goes to heaven, it's important for us to realize they will be immediately in the presence of Christ. Like the Apostle Paul says, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain, and to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. The Bible says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. In the summer of 2017, the Lord called home Mrs. Ann Kennedy, the longtime wife of D. James Kennedy. Together, they enjoyed 54 years of marriage. What I think made her so beautiful was that her inner beauty shone through the sparkle in her eyes and the sweetness in her smile. It's hard to imagine that she's even more beautiful in heaven there with her two leading men, Jesus Christ and my dad. Last night we received a letter from the White House and with Jennifer and Chip's permission as it's addressed to them, I'll read it to you now. It says, Dear Jennifer and Chip, I send my heartfelt condolences to you as you grieve the loss of a very special woman. Ann Kennedy's life of faith and action leaves an imprint for good and for God at Coral Ridge and across the world. And as you mourn her earthly departure, May you draw solace in the God of all comfort who comforts all of those who are in tribulation. 2 Corinthians 1, verses 3 and 4. Please be assured of my thoughts and prayers written by Michael R. Pence, Vice President of the United States of America. I think Anne would want you to remember her as a child of God saved by grace through the person and work of Jesus Christ. She would want you to know about God's faithfulness in her life. And she would want you to know that her testimony, her ultimate testimony, was that she was going to heaven. And that the only reason God was going to let her into heaven was because of Jesus and Jesus alone. And without a shadow of a doubt, she would want you to have the same testimony as well. The Christian assurance of life after death 
is based on the historical fact of Christ's resurrection from the dead. So even in the grief of death, the Christian can affirm the joy of eternal life through Jesus our Lord. Cyprian in the early centuries says this, that Christianity would have never overtaken the Roman Empire the way in which it did were it not for the plagues because they died differently than the unconverted. The pagans said, where is all this hope coming from? We die hopelessly. And the pagans said of the Christians, they carry their dead as if in triumph. Christians died differently because of their faith and their hope in Jesus Christ. So we have an opportunity to be able to demonstrate our faith by having a good death. By good death, I mean a death in which we are able to still witness before we die to the saving grace of Jesus Christ. What a comfort we have as believers in Christ that when we die, we go to be with the Lord forever. That is, if we are His. As the Apostle put it, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And one day our bodies will be raised as His was, having the confident assurance that we will be with Christ is vital since none of us knows the time of our departing. We just saw Erwin Lutzer talking about his classic resource, One Minute After You Die. Here's my good friend Jennifer Kennedy Cassidy to explain how you can get a copy. Jennifer, welcome. Thank you, Frank. One Minute After You Die by Dr. Erwin Lutzer answers the most important questions that face any of us. In it, he gives biblical answers to pressing questions about death and the afterlife including what heaven and hell will be like and how to prepare for your own final moment. What does happen one minute after you die? Knowing the answer to that question changes everything. And we want to send you this important book as our thanks for your generous donation of $35 or more to the ongoing work of this ministry. Simply write to us at D. James Kennedy Ministries, Box 11154, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, 33339 or call toll-free 877-962-7677, or go online to djkm.org. And along with the book, for your donation of $35 or more, we'll also send you a three-pack of the brand new Truth in Action Q&A booklet called, Did Jesus Rise from the Dead? This short booklet unpacks the powerful historical evidence for the bodily resurrection of Jesus in an easy to understand and memorable way. It will help solidify your own faith in the historical truthfulness of the gospel accounts of the resurrection. And you'll wanna also share copies with others. So contact us right away with a generous donation of $35 or more to receive the book, One Minute After You Die by Erwin Lutzer. Though the afterlife is often shrouded in mystery, the Bible does peel back the curtain and Dr. Lutzer will help you understand what is on the other side. And we'll also send the three pack of the Truth in Action Q&A booklet, Did Jesus Rise from the Dead? Or if you'd simply like the three pack of Did Jesus Rise from the Dead, we'll send it as our thanks for your generous donation. As you donate, you will be helping us broadcast powerful messages of truth and hope like this one to a world in desperate need of the good news. Simply write to us at D. James Kennedy Ministries, Box 11154, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, 33339, or call toll-free 877-962-7677, or go online to djkm.org. The 20th century British atheist Bertrand Russell was one of the world's most famous thinkers during his lifetime and was the author of the book, Why I Am Not a Christian. In that book, he argued with presumed certainty that man is the product of causes 
which had no prevision of the end they were achieving, that his origin, his growth, his hopes and fears, his loves and his beliefs are but the outcome of accidental co-locations of atoms, that no fire, no heroism, no intensity of thought and feeling can preserve an individual life beyond the grave. That is the bleak picture of unbelief. But Russell at least deserves some credit for his logical consistency. If we are merely accumulations of matter in motion, then the grave is indeed the conclusion. Without truth as an anchor, it should be no wonder that a century of evolutionary teaching has resulted in a generation in which things as basic as male and female, right and wrong, are now clouded in confusion. Suicide rates rise to record highs. America faces an opioid crisis. And the news brings reports of the latest school shooting just about every week. If we are, as Russell said, the accidental result of atoms randomly banging into each other, then there really is no ultimate difference between developing a polio vaccine or gunning down dozens of people. It's just atoms moving this way or that, and all of it will be gone soon enough. But the events of Easter Sunday tell us something different. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, then as Paul says, our faith is useless and it doesn't matter what we do. But Jesus did rise from the dead on Easter Sunday. The tomb was empty and the crucified Lord has arisen. Because Jesus is forever alive, you and I are extended the invitation to everlasting life. Because Jesus overcame death itself, we can have eternal life with him which means our lives matter. The things we do, the jobs we carry out, the families we raise, the deeds we do for others, it all matters eternally because Jesus is Lord. D. James Kennedy Ministries is standing for truth and defending your freedom. I'm Frank Wright. Thanks for joining us for this edition of Truths That Transform. We'll see you next time. Next week on Truths That Transform. Christianity is not a leap into the dark. It is a leap out of the dark and into the light of evidence. So we look at the evidence. What is the evidence? Well, briefly, um, I think three things convince me. That's next week. Today's program is available on DVD for your gift to this ministry of any amount. Please call, write, or log on to our website today. This has been a production of D. James Kennedy Ministries.